Two days later, I was restless and decided that maybe a trip over to Chelsea's Sioux reenactment camp would help relieve the boredom. I packed a cooler with a few adult beverages and a few packages of junk food, which I am sure were not on her historical camp's manifest. Bringing the booze bothered me a little for two reasons. The first was that I felt more than just a slight urge to start drinking again. I had done well resisting the bottle since I had been brought here. The inhibitor or my willpower was failing though, and I felt the pull growing stronger all the time. The second reason I was bothered was that I did not know if Chelsea would realize how hypocritical it was for me to gift Native Americans, even if they were simulated with alcohol. Since she was a history nerd, I suspected she was up to speed with the problems faced by the American Indians when the white men had allowed them access to abundant booze. In the end, I decided that the natives had had their own mind-altering hallucinogens long before booze had arrived. The Europeans were not the original cause of their woes, and now, almost two millennia later, the problem was long buried. Besides, if she thought it was in bad taste, ha, huh, she could just dump the booze later or refuse the gift in the first place. Yesterday had been colder and rainy, so I had stayed indoors most of the day, reading an old favorite book. In the afternoon, I had ventured out to the barn for a few hours to use the gymnasium and to get my blood circulating. My lame knee was acting up with the cold weather, and the movement helped. I caught myself considering just asking the machine to fix my leg. No, I would tough it out. The rains had ceased last evening, and today was just mostly cloudy. The temperature had risen to 45 degrees, but it was still windy. I was bundled up in a warm, insulated windbreaker with a tight-fitting hood. The buggy normally had just a windscreen and a roof, so I attached the removable clear polymer side covers to help keep out the worst of the weather. Now buttoned up, I set the buggy in motion. I used the autopilot for the drive over, and I simply watched for wildlife. The grass was wet, and there was some mud which made the ride slippery and interesting in spots. I was glad that I had sealed the cab as the spinning wheels had mostly covered the buggy with splatter by the time we arrived at the reenactment camp. Chelsea was outside chopping firewood. My goggles were off, which proved it was real wood she was chopping. I guess she needed a bit of actual firewood for campfires and such. I parked the buggy near the corral containing the two live Neo horses and made my way to where she was working. It looked like slow and hard work as she was using a pre-contact stone axe. I was a bit confused when she did not stop her monotonous chopping, nor acknowledge me at all. Was she mad about something? I politely said, good morning. Chelsea is currently involved in a question and answer session on a Conscientia historical subchannel. The session is scheduled to conclude in 14 minutes, her shell said in a monotone. Are you her augment or are you a remote AI monitor? I asked, I am the augment. John Abrams Prime, the shell answered. I did not bother to communicate with the simple augment any further and instead wandered about the camp inspecting the teepees and her food cache. I had brought my goggles just in case I wanted to see the full simulation, but left them in my pocket for now. The six androids were busy with various tasks. I noted they all kept away from me as I wandered around, probably still under some restrictions from their controlling AI. Down by the creek, I saw that there was a stone and pebble-covered ford. When I left here, I could use the ford to cross the creek and avoid becoming stuck. I adjusted my plans to head north from here when I left and to stop by the field base before returning home. I might as well meet my neighbors face to face and get that out of the way. I turned to see Chelsea approaching. She had put away the ax and was wiping the sweat off of her shell with a dry, soft leather chamois. John, sorry for the delay. I shook her hand in greeting, and we went back to her main teepee to get out of the cool wind. The structure's flap-covered entry faced south and let in the intermittent sun, so we took a seat on the floor's simulated woven ground covering to enjoy the warming rays. We spent an hour talking about her reenactment and other things. She told me about some of the funny questions she had answered during the earlier Q&A session. I was able to hold her in thrall by telling stories of my personal interaction with the remaining Indian tribes back in the time before the reset. Although the 20th century Sioux had, for the most part, lived the same modern lifestyle as the rest of humanity, they had still kept some of their traditions alive. I had attended a few of their powwows and other ceremonial gatherings, and Chelsea soaked that information up. She listened soberly when I described the conditions of living on the modern reservations. 
I tried to not sugarcoat anything and describe what I thought were their virtues and demerits, which I thought were ironically caused by both their semi-independence and their institutionalized dependency. We had a lunch of authentic fry bread, cooked on a hot stone, and a bit of the fresh elk meat that I had witnessed being harvested a few days earlier. After we ate, our conversation was interrupted by a loud noise a few miles south of us. It was a descending VTOL electrojet, which must have been landing at the field base. I used the distraction as an excuse to state that I had better be getting along home. Before I departed, I gave her the gift of the firewater. I was happy to see she accepted the bottles and snacks without hesitation. She also gave me a gift of a small bundle of freshly made elk jerky. Soon I was back in the buggy, this time heading south and through the tall grass. The field base should be south-southeast from Chelsea's camp at maybe a mile and a half distance. There was a clear trail in the grass, which meant that she had ridden her horse to visit the field base often. It occurred to me that the tourists who had visited here before I arrived would have loved the authentic appearing Chelsea and that she probably received generous donations from them. I suddenly got a smile on my face as I remembered the visit I had just had with Chelsea. There had been an awkward moment after lunch when Chelsea had inquired if I was by. I laughed to myself as I remembered the conversation. It's been over six months. John and I'm as horny as hell. I've got a handle on this mail shell. I'd almost snorted at her inadvertent pun. But I still miss real human contact. I know everyone assumes you're strictly hetero, but I hoped that since you're so old and have been in female shells that maybe you've adapted. I apologized and told her that I was stubborn and still just a plain old hetero. Oh well, I've got the female looking androids at least. One of them has this gadget, but it's not the same. I had tuned out the rest of her statement. Too much information. Her plight had reminded me that I was feeling a bit tense due to my own years of solitude. Maybe I'd have to put out a plea on the intimacy forums. It was possible there were a few weirdos out there with some sort of bearded old crusty guy fetish. It occurred to me that Chelsea's hookup attempt to me might have been broadcast on Conscientia. I wondered if it would help me market my situation. I topped a grassy knoll just northwest of the field base. Ahead of me, filling the small valley, was an assortment of warehouse-type utilitarian buildings along with the more aesthetically pleasing human dormitory. The dormitory building was mostly underground, but it did have a large glass-roofed entry annex. I had been in the dormitory twice long ago and remembered that the glass roof covered a large space that was filled with green trees and plants. It even had a nice heated pool and spa. The annex was an inviting place to just hang out, and it was a popular spot for the bold history tourists who visited the area during the cold winter months. At the southern edge of the valley, just beyond the buildings, was the hard surface landing field. Parked in a neat row were three smaller, short-ranged VTOL hopper transports. Behind the smaller craft, and still being serviced by two mobile units, was a larger, long-range VTOL electrojet. This must be the aircraft that Chelsea and I had spotted landing an hour ago. I drove the buggy down the worn horse trail to the base. Nobody human was outside that I could see. I parked the buggy on the pad next to the dormitory annex entry and went inside. The main doors were not locked and slid open as I approached. Inside was a vestibule with rows of clothing cubbies and a bench. I removed and hung my coat and used the bench to remove my slightly muddy boots. Finally, now just in my stocking feet, I rode the lift down to the floor level of the large half-underground annex. There I found the indoor mini-jungle, just as I remembered. There had been a few changes, however, and one of these was a new koi pond at the base of the trees. I paused for a moment to observe the many exotically colored fish. I also spotted turtles and other aquatic critters hanging out in the pond. Off to one side of the annex was a pool enclosure, and on the other side was the lounge area. All the comfortable lounging couches and chairs around the annex were empty, which confirmed my suspicion that the base had been cleared of tourists because of my sudden visit. I heard noises, including laughter, coming from the far end of the annex and went to investigate. Just past the mini jungle, I spotted a small group of humans. There were four of them, and they were seated at a round table by the food preparation and bar area. I moved to join them. Before I could announce myself, one of the group spoke up. Welcome, John. The building presence warned us that you had finally decided to pay us a visit. The speaker was a taller man. His shell was the perfect example of the well-built, 
prime-age male specimen which any man would love to have the use of. His companions were two females. One was younger, petite, and gorgeous. The other woman was slightly older, taller, and still pretty good-looking. Both ladies smiled as the man introduced them. I sensed intelligence and authority in the look I'd received from the older of the two. I slowed to a stop as I recognized the fourth member of the party. Even though it was facing away from me, it was clearly Omu. The man spoke up again. I'm Jess. He then pointed at the petite girl to his right. This is Angelina. He then turned to the taller woman on his left. And this is Beatrice. He then indicated Omu. You already know the fourth member of our group? I just nodded. I was sure they already knew all about me, probably more than I did myself. Omu did not turn to face me. Beatrice spoke up next. Please join us. I arrived an hour ago, and they are teaching me how to play poker. The other two humans snorted at that. I was a bit surprised to find them playing old-fashioned cards and not immersed in some sort of virtuality or other modern pursuit. They must have just finished a hand as all the blank cards were laying in a toss pile. I also saw that next to each player, the interactive table surface was showing an indication of their current scut values. I was relieved that the number displayed was just three digits. It looked to be a low-stakes game. I debated whether I should take a seat or bolt. It had been a long time since I played poker. Still, this would be awkward. Omu was here after all. I don't know, I said with a bit of hesitation. My shell does not have smart irises. I hoped that my excuse did not sound as lame to them as it did to me. Since the playing cards they were using were completely blank, unless you wore enhancement goggles or your shell possessed smart irises, you could not see the card's face values. If you had either, then you saw the face value as an overlay on the surface of the blank physical cards. The technology simplified shuffling as the values were simply randomly changed between hands. It also eliminated any peaking as only the holder could see the face values until the card was played. It also eliminated accidentally flipped cards and finally, best of all, it kept the card sharks and deck packers from being able to cheat. Not a problem. There's a pair of generic overlay glasses on the shelf right there, Angelina said, pointing behind the bar. I was stuck. I found the glasses and slipped them on. Instantly, the cards in the toss pile took on color and detail, and I could make out the face values on the ones that had been flipped over on purpose. Also, the scud amounts displayed on the table surface were now fully rendered as stacks of various colored chips. I took a seat between Beatrice and Jess. This put Omu and Angelina on the opposite sides. As I glanced at the buxom android, our eyes met. I will leave if you wish it, John, Omu stated quietly. I did not answer right away. After a long pause, which probably had the other three humans squirming in their chairs, I answered, No, it's okay, Omu. You can stay. I glanced at the other, now relived humans. What's the stakes? I asked. Jess answered, We usually only play for an hour or two after lunch so the buy-in is 500. Bet limits are for sci-fi to help prevent anyone from being felted too early before the hour is up. How long have you played so far? I asked. They looked at each other before Angelina said that they had started when Beatrice had arrived, maybe 45 minutes ago. Good, that meant that we would probably only play a dozen more hands. I was not worried about losing scuts as I had racked up plenty when I had been employed as a history teacher and guide. I also had a scud account in my name that held the yearly stipend which the new humans had granted me over a century ago. But I hadn't checked it after the first few years. It had not been much and I had not needed it at the time, so I mostly forgot about it to let it grow on its own. They might have even appropriated it all back by now for all I knew. Still, I did not have my smartwatch, nor did I have any smart coins. Could I even get to my money right now? Um, Omu... You still have access to my scut, right? I asked somewhat sheepishly. No, John, but Naomi does. Shall I request that presence transfer 500 standard caloric units to your table counter? Please, I answered. She did and my stack appeared. I noticed my S500 stack was still smaller than Beatrice's, who had the largest at the table. Teaching her to play indeed. Omu's stack was pretty large also. Um, I hate to be that guy, but is playing with Omu fair? I have temporarily suspended all of my biometric scanning capabilities, except for gross facial expression recognition, John. 
If you can keep your poker face intact, I won't kick your biological ass, the little android replied. I smiled despite myself. I realized that I had missed its snark. We all anteed up and the cards were dealt. I came up with a pair of kings, which winked and grinned back at me confidently. Although I felt excitement, I managed to hold in my smile as I tossed in a S5 bet. After the game, I joined the humans for coffee and tea. The game had been more enjoyable than I had expected. Even better, I had managed to hold my own and book a profit of S20. Jess and Omu had finished with slight losses each, while Beatrice left the game up nearly 300. The big loser had been Angelina, but she just smiled and said that she would have no trouble earning the lost guts back. While we had played, we had also talked. I had managed to learn what each of them specialized in and why they were here. Angelina was a highly rated touch therapist. She was in her mid-30s and had been doing therapy for almost 20 years. In this bright, enlightened future, that occupation meant all forms of touching. From simple hugs and massages, up through all forms of sexual pleasure. While she provided charity and treated people in need at times, she also gladly accepted payment. Thus, her lack of concern about a few lost scuts. She could earn them back in one good night of therapy. When I asked why she was here or if she was a history tourist, she replied that she had been hired to be here. I looked at the other two humans, but they refused to meet my eye. Oh, I was the reason she had been brought here. When I inquired as to who had hired her, all she would answer was that it had been an anonymous transaction. That was when I caught Omu's facial illuminations twitch before the android also looked away. Jess was a shrink, or whatever this age's equivalent was to the old era's psychologist. Since medical AIs handled most biological physical ailments, he was not a true psychiatrist and did not prescribe drugs. But he did work to perfect his art. Without formal degrees or official colleges, it was more like the master craftsman of old. Reputation was earned by being successful. Merit and recommendations buoyed his reliability and reputation and allowed him to make a profession of treating mental issues and suffering. Our new civilization had become something of a meritocracy, and as a libertarian-leaning old grump, I could not be happier. Let the people be free. Let them learn and do what they want. If they did well, let them succeed and be paid. If they did not, let them fail and be forced to try something different. With everyone interconnected, individual abilities, successes, and failures were easily quantifiable and disseminated. Buyer beware became the accepted practice as it was all too easy to be aware. And having the AIs around to serve as impartial mediators and judges, civil disputes were settled accurately, fairly, and quickly. So far, we had been successful in preventing the endless bureaucracies from forming in this era, and I prayed that they never would take hold. In addition to his abilities as a shrink, I learned that the Eudaimonia AI had urged and supported Jess's coming here to hopefully help me with my issues. I was intrigued that the major AI presence in charge of overseeing all human development and societal growth had any interest in my personal mental health. Did I really need to have Jess treat me? I thought back to my recent breakdown. It was likely I did need some form of help. Jess was already here, so I might as well see what he could do. I asked him when he wanted to get together to talk, and he surprised me by saying that he wanted to wait a few days to let me settle down first. Beatrice was the mystery girl. She was a scientist who had been living on a lunar farside station. Her arrival earlier today meant that she must have taken a torch to get from the moon to here as quickly as she did. She revealed that she had been pressured to come here by the Minervus AI, with additional urging from Praxia the AI responsible for planning humanity's retribution attack. Again, I was intrigued, to say the least. Two more major AI systems were interested in me enough to convince someone to drop what they were doing and to come all this way in such an expedited fashion. Both AIs should have been focused on matters far beyond one old human misfit on Earth. Minervus was the AI in charge of the defense of the solar system, while Praxia was responsible for planning the follow-on retribution attacks on the assemblage species. I had not been greatly involved in either effort in over a century. Why were they so concerned now? When I asked why the two AIs thought it was important to bring a human all the way from lunar far side to Earth just to see me, Beatrice said that she was here to simply observe. Observe what? I had asked. You and Omu, was all she would say. Around four in the afternoon, 
I expressed my wishes to go back home. At their invitation, I did agree to return tomorrow after lunch for another round of poker. I was just heading into the outer vestibule when Angelina came jogging up, carrying a small overnight bag. I'd like to come with you, John. I've never seen your prairie home. The only historical tour I have taken so far was the Nautilus tour. Oh, which one? The one in Sri Lanka? Or the one in the Galapagos Archipelago? I asked. The Sri Lankan one. I had been living in India at the time and took a hopper over. I enjoyed the high-speed underwater river ride the most. The recreation of the bunker was cool, but not very exciting. I did not want to spoil her impressions by explaining that the mini-sub ride I had performed a couple of centuries ago had not been that fun. Instead, it had been cramped, slow, and sultry. Even the faster return trip had been much slower than the high-speed submersibles they had running the tour route these days. You should try and go on the Nautilus experience at the Galapagos Islands sometime. The tram up to Cerro Crocker is beautiful, and the nape of the Earth simulated attack run ride is thrilling. The suborbital launch ride is a bit too much like regular space travel, though. I'd skip that, unless you have not been to space, I said. We got in the buggy and I set its autopilot to return us to my compound. Angelina was in the passenger seat looking like a big snowman in her white insulated and hooded parka. I had not resisted her self-invitation. After all, she had been hired to come here just for this, and I had to admit, I was as horny as hell. Although I did get plenty of tension-relieving sexual relief that night, what was more important overall was that I had felt intimate human contact again after such a long drought. After I had given Angelina a quick tour of my house and barn, we'd enjoyed a pleasant supper. Later, she had given me a long, full-body massage on the floor of the living room. When she had worked my tired and worn body down to pudding, she had finished by simply lying on my back and hugging me. I wept for at least ten minutes straight. Then she had led me to the bathroom and helped remove all the massage oil with a hot shower. Her petite shell was perfection. Curves in all the right places, but also very muscular. Despite her small stature, she was incredibly strong and had the powerful hands of someone who did massages for a living. It even appeared that my shell's old age and abused condition did not repulse her at all. Oh, I've treated a few with older shells than yours, John. Some people fear to be renewed as they also face substantial mental adjustments, she had replied when I'd asked. Their mental states are usually worse to deal with than their older shells, though. I understood what she was referring to. Our new human society offered, if not exactly immortality, at least the potential for a very, very long life. The requirements being that if you wanted that long life, you had to be a net positive to the future prospects of the overall society. Some people were not exactly a positive influence, and rejuvenating them was conditional. While we did not have the severely deranged and violent criminals of the past, there were still some who fell towards the bottom of the human bell curve. The current policy was that if these people wanted their lives extended by rejuvenation, then they would need to be fully mind data scanned and face whatever mental adjustments were needed to bring them to a more positive place personality-wise. Despite the fact that the mental review and adjustment was overseen by a jury of eudaimonia's sub-presences, and that those findings were then reviewed by a panel of randomly selected peers of live humans, some people still feared going through the process. The old shells which Angelina had referred to were those people, old and now due for a renewal, but who also feared the mental changes coming. Thus, the new era included old bitter dregs just like the old era had. Those dregs sometimes had needs, and if they had the scuts, and some touch therapist was willing to deal with them, the dregs got treated too. Angelina had had experience with them, apparently. I figured that I would be a piece of cake to deal with in comparison. Oh, in case you were wondering if any of those dregs were so fearful or stubborn that they held out against being mind-altered until they died? Of course. Humans needed to be free. Some bitterly clung to their freedom until the very end. No human or AI would step in against their wishes to rejuvenate them. They had the right to be who they were if they wanted. I knew all too well how they felt and was more sympathetic to their views now than I had ever been before. The next morning, Angelina did additional therapy on me. Less massage this time and more. Good old-fashioned hugging and touching. A morning round of sexual relief was included, 
and I was a happy and sated man. We'd also managed to have breakfast and get ourselves cleaned up. Towards noon, both of us headed back over to the field base. She invited me along to join the group for dinner, which was always a generous buffet with dozens of options. The buffet had many times the food needed for just us four humans, but when the leftovers could easily be reduced and stored as biomatter to be used again, the practice was not very wasteful at all. As I took my place in the chow line, I saw right away that we had a new member of the group, a male who looked to be a young teenager. Back at the table, Jess introduced me to the new person. John, this is my son Kyle. His class just finished a week-long survival training trip in the Bighorn Mountains west of here. I arranged to have the autobus drop him off on their way back to the Caribbean Learning Complex. The young man stood up to shake my hand. I was impressed with his manners. Nice to meet you, Kyle, I said. How long will you be staying here? Just a day or two, sir. Dad says I can use one of the hoppers to get to the autobus depot a few hundred kilometers east of here. I thought for a moment... That location would probably be the genetic school that existed over in southern old Minnesota. They would have daily school bus traffic coming and going to many places across the continent. Well, I hope you enjoy your stay here, Kyle, I said. Jess spoke up. Actually, I wanted to ask a favor, John. I have a long session of virtual therapy scheduled for this afternoon after our card game. While I am busy, would you be able to take Kyle over to the native reenactment camp? I had mentioned it to him this morning and he would like to experience it in person. I had no problem with that and said so. It was a better prospect than showing the kid my house and barn. Our card game after lunch was enjoyable. Omu sat out and allowed Kyle to take its place. The kid was smart but took too many chances. I smiled when I saw him cringe each time he lost a hand and had to fork over more scuts. At his age, without the skills and knowledge of an adult to fall back on, Working off scut debt could mean anything from hard, simple labor to sexual favors. Of course, the latter option was only if he'd already passed his BM test. Chelsea seemed happy when we reached her camp. She was going to the lake to do some spear fishing and agreed to take the kid along. I passed on waiting around in the cold lake water. I then lucked out because instead of having to wait around for their return, Chelsea offered to return Kyle back to his father after they were done fishing by using her spare Neo horse. Hearing that he would get to go fishing and then horseback riding had the kid grinning. I wished them luck and headed back to my compound, this time via the northern route. I watched them walk off towards the lake for a moment before I drove home. I wondered if the young lad was open to Chelsea's needs. Most teens were bisexual these days, but not all. Omu was waiting on my porch when I returned to the house after parking the buggy in the barn. John, I have brought you some human-grown produce which had been delivered to the field base an hour ago. It is in the refrigeration unit. Thanks, Omu. I... I didn't know what to say. You are welcome. I will return to the field base now. The short android turned to leave the porch. Omu, wait. I paused as I tried to figure out what I wanted to say. I'm... I'm trying, okay? I finally managed to say. I understand, John. Do not trouble yourself or feel any obligations. Like time, hope is infinite. With those profound words, the android walked away. I watched as it left. It started jogging down my drive and then kicked up the speed once it hit the paved road. Soon it was over the hill and gone, halfway to the field base in less than half a minute. Daddy! 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 I woke drenched in sweat. The nightmare had returned. I'd long since stopped having the damn dream with any regularity, so the emotions it dredged up hit me hard. I got out of bed and went into the bathroom to wipe down my face and upper body. When I got back in bed, I did not immediately return to sleep. The old memories and emotions were swirling. Finally, I did something I had not done for years. Please put me to sleep until morning. The implant just tingled in response, and in seconds, I was out. Angelina was in my bed when I awoke. She smiled and continued with what she had been doing to wake me. Soon, the rest of my body was as fully awake as my penis was. What a way to start the day. I hear you had a nightmare last night, she said when we had finally gotten out of bed. Omu or Naomi must have told her. I'd known that was a possibility when I had requested AI help get me back to sleep. Yeah, it happens sometimes. 
I've gotten used to them, mostly. Would it help if I spent the nights here with you? It would be no bother, she offered. Thanks, but not right now. I love your therapy and it's helped a bunch, but I'm not quite ready to sleep with anyone full-time right now. That level of intimacy would not be a good idea with the fragile state I was in. She took my rejection like a professional. In the bathroom after my shower, she helped me shave and braid my long hair. I had gotten out of the habit of trimming my beard and managing my hair during my years of wandering and appreciated the help. As I looked at myself in the mirror, I considered shaving my beard completely off and cutting my hair down to the short crop I'd always worn when I had lived like this. After all, if I was going to live indoors like a civilized man again, I no longer needed the facial hair for warmth or the hair for thread. We finished up in the bathroom and moved to the kitchen for our breakfast. Among the grub Omu had left were fresh melons. I had Angelina slice them into pieces while I cooked scrambled eggs. We had just finished eating when my display wall lit up with an incoming message. I wondered who had the authority to get through my comm filters. Good morning, John, Jess said after his face appeared on the display. His eyes tracked over to where Angelina was sitting, and he said good morning to her too. It made sense that Jess could get through my screen. The spam filter AI would have known I was seeing him daily and would have allowed him through. He continued, A situation has developed which needs my personal attention. I have to take the Electrojet and fly to the Forbin complex this morning. The trip will take an hour each way, and I expect to be at the facility for about the same. I'm inviting you along if you'd like to come. I would have you back sometime this afternoon and we could talk on the way. The outing would do you good. I looked at Angelina and asked, Who is invited? Angelina gave me a quick head shake. Well, anyone, I guess. Beatrice is also coming along, he answered. That sounds fine. Sure, I'll come. Angelina declines, though. Good. See you on the landing pad in 15? Sure, I'll be there, I said before cutting the vid. Thanks. That sounded kind of dull, Angelina said with a look of relief. No problem. What are you going to do while I am gone? Oh, there won't be enough for a poker game. The weather looks too cold and windy to do anything outside. I'll probably just hang out in the pool or maybe spend a few hours browsing Conscientia, she said. Um, if you don't mind a bit of extra work, I'd like for you to help out a friend of mine. I explained what I had in mind. She said that she had no problem going on a short buggy ride after dropping me off. I wanted her to visit Chelsea's camp for a few hours. She was a touch therapist after all, and Chelsea certainly needed a good touching. Even better was that she said she was on retainer for her full time here, so there would be no additional charge. We made it to the base's landing pad in time to catch Jess giving his son a goodbye hug and sending him off in one of the small hopper vattles. Beatrice was waiting near the open hatch of the larger electrojet. I saw that she was wearing a lightweight thermal shirt. It was powered and would keep her warm in the cold, but would still be comfortable indoors later. Angelina dropped me off, and instead of waiting with Beatrice by the electrojet, I walked over and joined Jess as he stood there watching Kyle fly away. I saw that his eyes were shining and said, It never stops being bittersweet, even when they get older. He just nodded and took a deep breath. After the small hopper had flown out of sight to the east, we turned and walked over to the waiting electrojet. Beatrice had already gone aboard, and I now saw Omu waiting by the stairs. I let Jess enter first and followed him in, giving the android a polite nod as I passed. The unit followed behind us and sealed the hatch. The Electrojet was clearly not a dual-purpose cargo model, as inside I found a VIP cabin layout appointed with luxurious seating for up to a dozen. Beatrice was already seated on the port side at the middle cluster of four seats. The seats in that group were the only ones with their automatic seat restraints open and waiting, and I realized that since we were a small group, it made sense to seat us all near the VTOL aircraft's center of gravity. The two forward seats in the cluster could swivel and were currently facing forward for takeoff acceleration. Jess chose the forward seat in either rear. Beatrice was across the aisle beside me, leaving Omu sitting beside Jess. As Omu seated itself, it offered to get us refreshments once we were at altitude and stable. I asked for a mug of coffee while the others wanted tea, 